Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's May 27, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, the censorship warriors on social media force Sun to pull their upside-down U.S. flag t-shirts. Plus, a self-parking Volvo malfunctions at a demonstration and plows right into journalists. That can be good. And a U.S. Marine is court-martialed for refusing to remove a Bible verse from her computer. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. And we begin tonight with a story about our First Amendment. We've given you stories before about kids being kicked out of school for wearing American flag t-shirts. But now we have the fashion outlet, PacSun. They've come under some heavy fire because they dare have a American flag t-shirt presented upside down. Now, many people took exception to this. There are numerous tweets. I'll just read one here to you. Honestly, if you don't respect the flag of the United States, go to some other country whose flag won't offend you. Now, I'll give these commenters the benefit of the doubt and say that they have the best of intentions when they stand up for the U.S. flag in this way, but I don't think they exactly understand what an upside-down flag means. Now, if you burn a flag, if you stomp on a flag, oh, yes, that is offensive, and you're trying to be very controversial, but if you have an upside-down flag, all that is is a symbol of distress. It means there's something wrong, there's something not right. If you come across a base out somewhere and the flag is up, upside down, oh man, there's something going on here. I need to go check it out. And that's what an upside down flag represents. Now, as far as Pac Sun, were they trying to make any type of political statement? I'm not exactly sure. But the American flag in general, hung upside down, is not offensive. It's just a sign of distress. What type of distress? Well, let's go talk to our troops. They have them growing the opium in Afghanistan. They come back home, they can't get any treatment running guns into Mexico, you know, CIA bringing cocaine in, all types of wild, crazy things that have happened through the course of our American history. So yes, I would say our country is in distress. And for more on this, if you would like to get your own upside down American flag t-shirt, because you may not be able to get it at PacSun, you can go to the InfoWarsShop.com and pick up one, or you can pre-order one, that is to say, because they're not in just yet, but they will be soon. For the price of $19.95, you can get your upside down American flag t-shirt. And it also has some subtext on there so you can explain to people why you are wearing such a thing in these United States. Now, as we continue our talk about free speech, not just the American flag, but also people's religious beliefs. We've talked to you before about the people at Fort Hood being classified as terrorists for, for their being a Christian in the United States of America. And now we have a Marine court-martialed for refusing to remove a Bible verse from her computer. And they said that it could easily be seen as contrary to good order and discipline. This is what they said about Lance Corporal Sterling. In the heinous phrase that she dare had on her computer, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, which I think if you're a Marine is a pretty good thing to keep in mind. And it says that Ms. Sterling is currently unemployed and looking for work, but because she had a bad discharge, it's making it very difficult for her. So hope that people will come to her and support her in her time of need. Now, we all have needs of certain things, and modern conveniences, I guess, kind of fills that gap. We have smartphones, we have smart TVs, you can even buy a smart refrigerator that tells you when you're out of milk. But what about a smart car? If something goes wrong with these things, who is going to be held accountable? And most people who think about smart cars think of them as something like this. Stop. But in actuality, self-driving cars are much more like this. And this is a self-parking Volvo, and it just plowed into a man because the owner did not pay the extra fee to get the feature that stops cars from crashing into people. Now, it seems to me that you would want this to be somewhat of a standard feature, just like a, a horn or a headlight or a seatbelt. But in the trendiness, the trendy world of the automobile, they want you to pay extra for something that could actually save somebody's life. And who's going to be held responsible if this thing goes on the road and kills somebody? Well, you can bet your bottom dollar Volvo is going to do everything or whoever these uh, automated car makers are. They're going to do everything to make sure that they're not held in the wrong. They're probably going to blame the driver. Well, you didn't pay that extra however much to get that special feature, so it's your fault and you need to be held accountable. Now, talking about accountability, an agency that does not have this at all, the NSA. 
And now we have this report saying the NSA can identify you by your smartphone handwriting. Well, what does that mean? The NSA has technology that can identify anyone from the way they swiped in text on a smartphone, according to officials with Lockheed Martin who helped design it. So there you go, everybody who says that uh, nobody's tracking you on your phone, nobody can look at your pictures, we'll go tell that to Kate Upton and all the rest of the starlers have their naked selfies all over the internet. And now they're saying they can even track you by the way you type on your smartphone. So there you go, everybody who thinks that the surveillance state is not real. And we'll end tonight with something that definitely wasn't real. A group of anti-gunners got together and said, hey, let's put together a shop where we can bring people in and shame them into not buying a firearm. And then they took a step back. Well, how about if we get paid actors to play these salespeople? People said, okay. Then they took it another step and said, well, let's just fake the whole thing. We'll put up cameras everywhere. It'd be like a reality show minus the reality where we'll have our staff behind the counter as actors. We'll have actors in front of the counter and it'll all be fake what will make guns look bad. And it says paid actors pose to be potential gun buyers who were convinced by a gun store clerk, also an actor, not to buy a firearm as part of an anti-gun group's experiment designed to deceive the public. So these are the type of dirty tricks they have to play. They have to completely fake something to make you believe that everybody hates guns in the United States of America, whereas you can contrast that what happened here in the state of Texas. A couple years ago, we go out to the Alamo. There's a thousand plus people who showed up, marched peacefully, nobody got shot, lo and behold. And these are the type of things that actually happen in reality. We don't have to fake, you know, good, peaceful people coming together. And, of course, you can go Google and find, you know, a couple of uh, rambunctious guys, you know, having words being mouthy with people. And that's another thing I want to talk about. To all these anti-gun groups who say that, you know, these open carriers or whoever come out and harass your guys, at the footage we just showed you of those guys marching at the Capitol or at the, uh, at the Alamo, there's an anti-gun group who will remain nameless because whatever. They came and trolled us. They picture, put up a picture of Master Sergeant C.J. Grisham, U.S. Army retired, saying, hey, this is the type of guy who wants guns in the United States of America because he's a returning veteran, has fought for his country, and dare wants the rights that he fought to protect when he comes back home. So one day, C.J., he's out you know, having a nice walk with his son, uh, and he has an AR-15, I believe it was, strapped to his chest. He encounters an officer in his county. The officer says, officer says sir, why do you have this firearm? He says, well, officer, you know as well as I do, there are wild hogs and other type of game out here. I need to protect my son if a situation should arise. The officer says, well, sir, I'm going to arrest you for rudely displaying a firearm. Long story short, the anti-gun group trolled CJ and all the open carriers, and then they get mad when uh, open carriers show up to their events. Now, these things are happening uh, less and less frequently, but just to put that on record so everybody knows. And that's a very long-winded way of telling you that we do have a new sponsor. It's a firearms manufacturer, and we'll show you that new, uh, a new commercial, that new ad coming up here in just one moment. But coming up after this break, we have a special report from Paul Joseph Watson, and also I'll talk to a very concerned citizen about the state of our affairs in the United States of America, talking about how officers deal with dogs in the field. Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. 96% of Americans believe that the U.S. will witness more Baltimore-style riots this summer. The elite know that these riots are coming because, to a large extent, their policies have created the environment for them. Wealth inequality, which is proven to cause social unrest, is at its worst since before World War II. But wealth inequality isn't caused by a failure of capitalism, it's caused by catastrophic Keynesian central bank policies that have instituted endless money printing and worldwide inflation. And it's not just America, it's the world. The gap between the rich and the poor has widened everywhere. This huge disparity is not because of some flaw in capitalism. The problem is central banks that are out of control, printing money like no one ever imagined, and have created a massive worldwide financial inflation. But by blaming capitalism, leftists who warn about wealth inequality are playing right into the elite's hands. Because their solution is going to be more power in the hands of the state and central banks, the very same policies which caused the problem in the first place. 
Wealth inequality is being exacerbated by a drop in real wages. As real wages drop, it will become increasingly harder to pacify younger generations via consumer culture. With religion, family and social mobility all declining in influence, lifestyles built around the acquisition of products will become harder to maintain as the economic environment worsens, prompting further disenfranchisement amongst young people. This effect is amplified by the global political awakening acknowledged by elitists like Zbigniew Brzezinski. A political renaissance that has been driven by the increasingly widespread availability of information thanks to the internet. I'm deeply troubled that a very vague, emotionally stated, semi-theologically defined diagnosis of the central global menace is obscuring our national ability to comprehend the historically unprecedented challenge which is being posed in our time by a massive global political awakening and thus is obstructing our ability to deal effectively with the global political turmoil that this awakening is generating. This awakening has in turn led to more distrust in government and leadership in the United States and other Western countries, another precondition for civil unrest. The toxic cocktail of increased corruption, social alienation and lack of community, all contributory factors to the 2011 London riots, will heighten the risk of domestic disorder. In an effort to derail this organic global political awakening, elitists like George Soros, who predicted class war and riots over three years ago, are bankrolling what on the surface appear to be grassroots uprisings in an effort to steer and divert their impact. This is why Black Lives Matter, funded to the tune of $33 million by Soros, has increasingly become about toxic racial division instead of addressing the causes of police brutality. An uprising that could have been centred on reducing state power has instead been hijacked from below by criminal opportunists and from above by the elite itself. Now that this uprising has been subverted, the elite will use the fallout violent riots and looting in major cities across America to enlist support from average Americans for an increase in state power. And in the aftermath of the next financial collapse, economic totalitarianism, government-controlled bank accounts, and a move towards banning cash altogether. It's the age-old problem-reaction-solution method at play once again. As Brandon Smith explains, the international banking cult has no interest whatsoever in saving the current system, despite the assumptions of many market analysts. Their only goal has been to stave off the visible effects of the crisis until a new system is ready, psychologically justified in the public consciousness, to be put into place. This new system will be characterized by more authoritarianism a bigger police state and less economic freedom. And we know that the elite are expecting this crisis because they've made very clear preparations to deal with the fallout. The New York Times reported that the wealthy are installing expensive bulletproof safe rooms in their luxury apartments and homes to protect against increased criminality, looting and physical threats to their safety. Economist Robert Johnson also revealed that elitists at the Davos Economic Forum told him they were buying remote hideaways in places like New Zealand to escape potential Ferguson-style uprisings on a bigger scale. A lot of very wealthy and powerful people are quite afraid right now. They see us on an unstable trajectory. They don't see our political institutions being what you might call representative, responsive, and pulling things together. But as the system doesn't have proper resources, as it doesn't represent people, things are getting more and more dangerous as, say, Ferguson, Missouri brings to bear. When asked, realtors selling this property said their wealthy clients were making these purchases because they were, quote, paranoid 
about, quote, what is happening around them. Urban unrest experts like Dr. Max Herman say that the United States is on the cusp of a new cycle of civil unrest. Economist Martin Armstrong predicts that a, quote, serious political uprising will erupt by 2016 in the United States. I wouldn't go that far, but it's virtually guaranteed that we will see more widespread domestic disorder over the next two years if we continue to follow these disastrous Keynesian economic policies and allow populist social justice movements to be hijacked and subverted by the powers that be. The elite are busy making preparations for the outcome of this next phase of the crisis. The question is, are you? We all the time hear about police shootings, police brutality, things of that nature. And something that sometimes flies under the radar is when these things happen to animals. You know, I myself, just living here in the city of Austin, have had a chance to cover this, or should I say the unfortunate task of covering these things, because what happens is you have a let's say a mail carrier or a pizza man or somebody else who may encounter a dog and they don't pull out a gun and shoot them, they pull out a can of pepper spray or maybe they have some type of stick and they wave at the dog. But sometimes these officers just don't know how to behave themselves and here's proof positive of that. We gotta think about life, death, family, death back. I fired one shot into the dog's head. Drug dealers have aggressive dogs. Have you ever seen a drug dealer using a Labrador dog? No. The police officer had shot and killed their dog, and that dog was a Chihuahua. And for more on this, we go to Michael Ozias, the maker of the film Of Dogs and Men. All right, thank you for joining us today, Michael. Thank you for having me, Jakari. So we just played the trailer of your piece. So tell us what inspired you to make this in the first place. The initial inspiration for me came from uh, just browsing videos on YouTube. Don't remember exactly how I came upon it, but there's this video of James Smoke. Uh, he's just on his knees on the side of a Tennessee highway, surrounded by cops. He's worried about his dog presumably getting out and getting into traffic. The doors are open. His dog, General Patton, hops out of the car, runs around looking for him, and one of the officers shoots the dog in the face with a shotgun. That was the first thing that I saw. And uh, so I was upset about it, and I looked to find out if there were more of these incidents, and, uh, and sadly, it opened my eyes to the whole thing. I saw more videos, heard more news stories. This was a couple of years ago. And so then I approached uh, the producer of the film, Patrick Reasonover, with, the, um, with what I had found and wondering if he thought that this was worth pursuing. And uh, he felt the same way. So we started making the film. And who is the filmmaker you're working with? Patrick Reasonover. He's the producer. So I was looking at the trailer for your piece, and I recognized one of the uh, incidents that happened right here in the city of Austin, the story of Cisco the dog. This actually happened here before I moved to the city to work for Alex. But it's a very popular story. You know, I go to a lot of the rallies around town. People still talk about it. Uh, basically, an officer, he was giving the proper address, but it was the wrong residence, if that makes sense to our viewers. Somebody called into the police station. They said, hey, you need to go to this address. He went to the proper address, but it wasn't the uh, place where the incident was occurring. Anyway, uh, Cisco the dog runs out towards the officers, as most dogs would. In wagging the tail, maybe even barking a little bit, the officer pulls out a pistol, shoots the dog dead. And then, you know, when uh, the dog owner says, sir, you just shot my dog, the officer kind of shrugs his shoulders and walks off to show. It's a very common thing that happens, and it's very unfortunate, but, you know, in a society now where we hear about police shootings every week, it's almost to a point where nobody pays attention unless it happens to a dog. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the, the whole conversation obviously is, is uh, getting intense nationally about police use of force in general and stories about uh, people. Um, but yeah, I mean, the dogs, I think I asked, a, I asked a local journalist one time why we don't hear about more of these stories. And she basically told me, like, it, when you're working the beat as a local journalist, you need the cooperation of law enforcement. And so when a dog gets shot, 
they kind of have to run this calculus. Is it worth getting local law enforcement upset by us doing this story when it's a dog? You know, if it's a person, that's a different thing. But I think it was like, uh, it was just interesting for me to hear that perspective and and gain an understanding of like how it actually works at a local well, I can assure you that's not an issue that we have. Uh, yeah. I've had to talk to, I haven't talked to APD about any dog shootings in my tenure here. I've talked to them about several other things, but like you said, uh, a lot of the news agencies, they want, don't want to run afoul, you know, getting the big stories and the scoops and all this stuff and being invited to the uh, police picnics and all this stuff. So, I mean, yeah, I, I understand exactly where you're coming from with that. And as far as your research, how long did it take you to research the film and put it all together? We've been at it for over two years at this point. Um, we, uh, we initially just bootstrapped a few, a uh, few of the, uh, the first stories. We covered Shal Shai Calvo, his two black labs, Peyton and Chase, were um, shot in a raid in his home. Uh, he did nothing wrong. Cindy Bowling, who lost her, her dog, Lily, uh, at a wrong address. Um, it's, we just, we just started kind of just grabbing our cameras and just bootstrapped some, some of these shootings. And, and we did some of the stories and then we kind of researched as we went and people, as soon as it became known that we were making this film, uh, we were getting sent a lot of stuff. People were letting us know every time they heard about another incident. And, um, <clears throat> and so we just tried to make a mix of stories that were, uh, some were happened a while ago, but it gave us an opportunity to find out like what the full aftermath was. Was there a lawsuit? Was there a resolution? Were there changes? And then like in the case of Michael Paxton there in Austin, uh, it, Cisco had, had been shot fairly recently, uh, at the time that we captured his story, it was still very raw for him. And it was, it was tough for him to tell and, and, uh, and emotional to, to record it and hear his story as he walked us through beat by beat what happened so it, it's kind of like it kind of became this organic mix and we just traveled light and uh and just kind of followed followed the stories where they took us right and i noticed you also have law enforcement officers in your piece not to give too much of the film away but what was was there a general sense that you got from the law enforcement officers was it a different take from each person it, it would, I would say it was, it was pretty much a general sense. They, um, they have their side and we want their side presented in the film and they, they make their case about, you know, how dangerous their work is. And, um, and in, in a lot of cases, they're not, they're not properly supported currently. If the administration is not making a priority about dogs, training them for encounters, giving them the gear they need, supporting them and trying non-lethal means, then they, they, they don't have that on their side uh, either. So they're left with really just kind of what training they can infer from other things. And that's how we end up with this lethal force solution being used uh, so, so frequently now, but they, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you, you can agree or disagree with them, but we definitely made it a point that we wanted to talk to them and we want to hear them make the, the best case for, for what their situation is, and we want the audience to make their own estimations on whether they think these shootings are justified, whether they, you know, whether they believe law enforcement and the the reasons for keeping the status quo as it is, or whether or not they want to see change. Exactly, and I don't have any hard figures in front of me, but I would imagine that people like mail carriers or pizza men or other people who may encounter dogs on a semi regular basis don't have near the fatality numbers that some of these officers do, they employ other means, you know, pepper spray, things such as that. Did that factor into the film at all? Uh, yeah, in fact, one of the activists that we talked to, he formerly was a, uh, a, a did deliveries for UPS, and um, he talked at length to us about his means of handling the dogs and what uh, UPS expected from him as an em employee. and. Um, and, and he was able to handle it. That's part of why he, uh, his name is Jeffrey Justice, and that's why he's become so active. Uh, it's part of the reason is he says, I face this all the time, and I dealt with it. And in fact, worldwide, we have not found a case of a law enforcement officer being killed by a dog in the line of duty. So that includes parts of the world where, where law enforcement doesn't carry 
lethal force, or at least not as efficient as a sidearm. And uh, so it's, it's, it really just kind of reads as, as, as feeling very irrational, especially since so many of these incidents end with the justification that the officer was in fear for their life. And so it's, it's just an odd juxtaposition, this, this level of fear of something that has never happened that we can, that we can find. Right, and I believe you also have an officer in your trailer who echoed the same thing. He said there hasn't been an officer that he's aware of that has been, you know, murdered in the line of duty by a dog. You know, and I can understand, you know, dogs can be distracting if you have a, a fleeing suspect or somebody who you think is a threat to you, you know, trying to do something behind the scenes. But just the dog itself, like you said, has not killed anybody that we are aware of. So, Michael, tell us uh, where people can find the film and, you know, what we can look forward to when we actually see it. Uh, you can find out more about the film at ofdogsandmen.net. Uh, our trailer is up there. We have some stories, uh, some, some more information about some of the stories we cover. And uh, presently, we are just seeking to set up the distribution home for the film. And um, we, we still have a bit more work to do on it. Uh, we're finishing that up. So we don't exactly have a release date yet. We are just crossing our T's, dotting our I's, and, um, and trying to figure out where it's going to make its premiere so that people can check it out. So if, if people want to follow us on Facebook and check out our website or sign up for you know, email updates on the site, then uh, they'll be in the loop. We'll let everybody know as soon as we know where, where it's going to premiere. Right. And as far as the film, do you expect it, or would you like to see it in theaters, or is it a home release, or what are you guys planning? Uh, we're, we're actually pretty agnostic about that. We're trying it. We're just trying to get it in front of, you know, whoever can actually get it to the people. And, you know, if that, if they feel that the best route for that is theaters, then theaters works for us. If it's TV, if it's DVD, if it's video on demand, however that pans out, we just want, we just want to get it out there so people can see it and hopefully it can affect some change. All right, Michael Ozias, give us your final thoughts. Final thoughts. Well, I just uh, I'm I'm hopeful that there there can be progress, and um, I think that uh, it can happen constructively. And I just I feel like I'm 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 concerned because recently they, in the Commerce City, Colorado shooting, the officer faced charges of animal cruelty, and they didn't stick. But my fear is that if things keep continuing the way they're going, and we don't have constructive solutions, some officer somewhere is going to be the first one to go to prison for shooting somebody's dog. And uh, I, I, I just, I think that we can, I think we can fix this before that happens without more shootings and lawsuits and, and, uh, and other ugliness. We can, we can fix this, we're trying. All right, Michael Ozias of dogsandmen.net. Thank you for your time, sir. Thanks, Jakari. Well, that's it for our show tonight. 